Um, I'm really excited to be here today. I'm a sociologist of the economy in a business school. And my area of focus has been for about 25 years now focusing on diaspora investments. What motivates it? What challenges diaspora uh, entrepreneurs and, and investors face? And how to make more of that happen for economic development? Uh, so I'm new to tourism. Um, but as you'll see as I, I talk today, tourism is becoming an ongoing theme in a lot of the work uh, that I do in various different research teams. Um, much of the work in diaspora tourism, it is obviously a field in the area of tourism. It's nascent, but certainly growing and growing rapidly. Much of that brilliant scholarship falls along the lines of looking at the role of tourism in identity. Much along, uh, some of Steve, uh, Stephen's work, of course, is, uh, uh, is, is part of that. It's, I think, a very important work because we need to understand the role of this type of tourism and how it makes diasporans feel about themselves and their connectedness to their country of origin. And I'll come back to that uh, in a minute. There's been, of course, some work that looks at the role of diaspora tourism in terms of its contribution to the overall economy. But much of that work that looks at sort of country of origin, economic effects of diaspora tourism, really focuses on those immediate effects, but not so much on the long-term effects. But yet, I can tell you from all of the work that we've done on diaspora investment in entrepreneurship, I hear story after story, particularly from diaspora entrepreneurs, about how their idea for a business, their desire to go back home to make a business, began with some kind of trip experience. So I think at the very heart of, before we even get started with some of the specific case studies, I think we need to remember that in order to, to make a decision about investing or start a business in a country of origin, usually tourism in some way, shape, or form has played a role uh, in that process. But I didn't begin to think about this very specifically until last year when I was doing a research project for USAID and the White House with the US Indian diaspora. Now, it wasn't about tourism at all, which makes, I think, this an interesting story. We were doing a concept test for a very specific diaspora investment vehicle. The vehicle itself, which is now actually available, it's a fixed income security marketed to the US Indian diaspora to raise funds to be lent to small and medium-sized enterprises in social impact areas in India. That means Indians in the diaspora can invest, in, invest their money for a fixed period of time, and that money then goes to sanitation, education, health care back in India. And this, is a, uh, this particular product is available now from the Calvert Foundation and is supported by uh, USAID with partial guarantees. Now, interestingly enough, my job as a researcher was to concept test this and in particular try to figure out what types of product attributes do we need to build into this diaspora investment vehicle in order to make it more attractive for the US Indian diaspora community. So being in the world of business and finance, we were thinking more about things like interest rates and maturity term and who should issue this particular security. We weren't thinking about tourism. But as we went around the, uh, the US and various different uh, diaspora communities and did focus groups, we kept hearing the same story about the Sankara I Foundation. I don't know how many of you know about this foundation. But it, is, uh, it was started by a US Indian diaspora doctor who is an ophthalmologist who has gone back to India and has done fantastic work setting up eye clinics. Now, the really fantastic thing, I think, about this model is that he has set up the opportunity for diasporans and others who are interested in this particular charity to go and visit spend time in actually seeing how those charitable dollars are actually at play and at work. And so what we heard from our focus group participants over and over again was, we wish that this particular financial model that you're setting up would provide us the opportunity to be able to travel to see the impact of our investment, either to A, decrease my anxiety, to even try out 
So it could incentivize trial by creating this opportunity to go check it out first and then put money on the table. Or B, you know, I'd be willing to give you as a start a little bit of money. You know, I might, I might do the entry fee of a of, of thousand dollars to this fixed income security, but I'm not going to put big money on the table until I make this visit. So in other words, this type of a model could enhance repeat business. So then we started to realize that but this happened. I mean, this reference to this particular I Foundation kept coming up over and over again. We started to think more seriously about how could and how does tourism play a role in decreasing the concerns and fears that diaspora investors have about corruption, in their countries of origin. And this is a very huge, it's the major impediment often to diaspora investment, whether it be direct or portfolio investment, are concerns and fears around corruption and trust. How can tourism, we've started to think, play a role in building that foundational trust to increase both trial as well as repeat business in diaspora investment models in various different contexts. This conversation continues, and even yesterday, yesterday we had this big event uh, at the World Bank around the Sierra Leonean diaspora. We've done a big diaspora mapping project there, and one of the things that we realized is that there is a huge interest in that community in investing in both microenterprises, small and medium-sized enterprises, and some talk about some new investment clubs emerging so the diaspora can find a way to to help uh, contribute to post Ebola economic recovery there. And again, we started talking in these roundtable discussions about what if you could go back and actually see some of these businesses that you're going to be able to invest in? How would that increase your concerns and fears? And it was the, the amount of enthusiasm in the room when we brought that as a possibility, as a possible attribute to those investment models was almost really hard to measure. People said that would be fantastic. So we're starting to, again, sort of think about this role of tourism um, sort of in building it into these models themselves. But in terms of diaspora investment promotion, it's not just about what products you put out there, what services you put out there. It's also about the roles that governments play in trying to market themselves to their diaspora communities. And so I started to think more about how could tourism itself play a role in affecting some of the different motivational drivers that we know that exist that really kind of contribute to a diaspora making this decision to actually invest. And if you go back to some of the, the earlier work that we've been doing in diaspora investment, uh, we've identified a model. We've been able to sort of disaggregate both theoretically and empirically diaspora investment motivation into four component parts. Now, within any given diaspora community, the relative contribution of these four component parts varies. And of course, it varies at the individual level. But in general, there are four main reasons why a diaspora might want to invest either by starting a new business back at home or in some kind of portfolio investment model. Sometimes they want to invest because it makes them feel good to do so. It's part of what they feel is their duty or they feel like they'd have a per personal accomplishment if they were to invest back home. In other cases, obviously, they're just interested in making money. They want to have some personal financial independence or add to the diversity of their investment portfolio. In some cases, social status motivations play a big role. In the case in which investing back home is something that is considered to be socially desirable by the diaspora community or the country of origin community, sometimes investments are made because the hope is, if they do so, they'll gain in social status. Sometimes it's thought if you invest in your country of origin, you might get greater influence over the political process or greater access to political actors and so on. So we've begun to sort of have conversations with various different home country governments that are trying to design investment promotion experiences for uh, potential diaspora investors. And a country that really gets this right is the Republic of Georgia. I had the great opportunity uh, this summer to participate in one of the amazing events that the State Minister for Diaspora Affairs hosts in the Republic of Georgia. And he has built into his Diaspora Day experience 
experiences on all four of these dimensions to promote for an investment. So on one given day, he brought together around 100 different potential diaspora investors from the Georgian diaspora, there for Diaspora Day, and he took us out to a, on a series of visits to different potential investment targets. While we went through this experience, at various parts during the day, emotional motivations were played to. I'll give you one example. We walked in at lunch, and then there was this amazing Georgian choir that broke out into nationalistic song right after we had just been given an example of an outstanding agricultural business in order to invest in. And I watched these potential investors break into tears and break into song and sort of feel that sort of patriotism. <laughs> then they were escorted into an auditorium where they got access to major political uh, figures, the mayor of that particular town and others from the sort of state uh, government itself to ask questions about the investment climate and the investment opportunities uh, in Georgia. Of course, they were, they were provided with all kinds of the typical sort of financial and investment promotion kinds of statements to play to that uh, side of the issue. And at the, end of the, at the end of the day, they were given awards recognizing the various services that they've provided to the overall Georgian diaspora community, sort of really playing to those social status uh, types of emotions. So that trip, that visit back to Georgia, played to all four of these emotions, and we're seeing, or, oh, excuse me, all four of these dimensions, and we're seeing some of the returns, because already some of the investment deals have started to come in from just this summer. Um, um, around a quarter of those who have attended uh, that event have had some contact with the state ministry uh, about uh, potential investment, the last I heard. So what I'm trying to propose here is simply this idea of thinking about the tourism itself playing a role in what we typically think about is the diaspora engagement value chain. Typically, we've been thinking it begins first with remittances, you're sending money back home to friends and family, and then you make some diaspora investments from afar, either through philanthropy, going back and, and, and volunteering, or uh, some kind of portfolio investment kind of option, and then direct investment. But I think that there's an intermediate step that we need to really start thinking very deeply about and creating both on the home country government side, uh, but also on the diaspora investment uh, financial types of, of product sides, start thinking about the role that tourism can play in that process. So this is a pre very preliminary paper, but I very much welcome your comments and feedback on it. Thank you.